a while ago, I was walking with a friend in the woods when we saw this strange tree sticking out amidst the other trees. And we went closer to take a look, and it turned out that this is, in fact, not a tree at all, but rather a cell phone antenna mast <laughs> disguised as a tree. <laughs> now, why am I showing you this? Rest assured, I'm not here to sell you some metal wood. However, I do think it's interesting for two reasons. On the one hand, it shows our desire to design our environment according to an idealized image of untouched nature. Secondly, and perhaps even more importantly, it shows how technology becomes an invisible part of our environment, up to the level that we don't recognize it as technology anymore. We want to walk in an untouched landscape, but with cell phone coverage. <laughs> And I think everyone can agree that such a tree, such a metal tree, is not nature. It's a simulation. At best, it's a picture of nature, like a landscape painting you would hang above your couch. Later, I will argue that much of what we think of as nature is, in fact, a simulation, while at the same time, a next nature emerges where we least expect it. But first, let's talk a little bit more about how images of nature can be used to sell almost anything. Actually, your homework for the next week is to look in your daily environment and count the number of times that you encounter products that use images of nature to sell themselves. You will find many examples. I already did this exercise myself and discovered there are some different strategies. One strategy is to simple, simply use Natural aesthetics. Apple is not a fruit company. Lacoste does not sell crocodiles. And uh, Puma shoes, they are not made of Pumas, although they do refer to the sporty animal. Then there are the products that promote a natural feeling, like these condoms. Natural condoms. I don't know what exactly is natural about <laughs> condom use. But somehow, when I'm at the groceries and I have to choose between 26 brands of condoms, I just pick the natural ones. <laughs> and then there's the whole development of green products. <laughs> this, this green Hummer is maybe just a little bit less polluting than the previous model. <laughs> and of course, there's also a whole category of organic products. Products that have been developed according to nature. But what that exactly is, is never really defined. What we see here is an organic insecticide. So you can kill off nature, but in a nature-friendly way. <laughs> and on the day that organic coke is brought on the market, we know this development has reached its summit. Now, you may find it surprising or even a little bit shocking how often images of nature are being used to sell stuff. Yet there's a hidden layer underneath. And perhaps even the most smartest marketeers are not really aware that while they are using images of nature to sell us products, at the same time, they're also promoting a very one-dimensional, romanticized notion of nature. Nature as the inherently good, balanced, harmonic, and beautiful force of life. While the more darker sides of nature are consistently omitted by the marketeers. As you cannot sell products with death, diseases, unpredictability, and other extreme amoral qualities, nature also has to offer. So why is it that despite the countless attempts to save nature and to restore our balance with nature, no one ever asked the simple question, what is nature? And who decides that? And how do we move on from here? We can continue to treat nature as spectacle, that beautiful phenomenon that we watch in the documentaries on our flat screen televisions. We can do that. But we will never be able to solve important issues like global warming, climate change, uh, decrease of biodiversity, and urban, urbanization. If we are to understand our relationship with nature, we need to begin at the beginning. It is now five billion years ago since our planet came into existence. 
And at first it was just this lonely rock floating in space. It had a geosphere, but it still took over 3 billion years for the biosphere to evolve on planet Earth. And one billion year later, mankind emerged. And with the emerging of mankind and the arrival of people, a new sphere is emerging, which is the technosphere, the sphere of all human technology. So it's a simple message. Evolution goes on. And we all know Darwin, who envisioned the idea of evolution some 150 years ago. Yet, when we think of our relationship with nature, intuitively, we still feel as if we stem from this biblical, natural paradise. But the truth is, we are all born in a world that has been designed already. Look around you in the room you are in now and try to find the most natural thing in this room. Indeed, it is you. So nowadays, young children know more brands and logos than birds and tree species, not only in the western part of the world. And while with our science and technology, we slowly and steadily transform our original natural environment into a world of design, at the same time, our technological environment slowly but steadily grows beyond our control. So what will we leave for the future? And what will our own future be? <laughs> okay, don't worry. This is a Photoshop. <laughs> However, metaphorically, I think this image is, is very true, as it perfectly exemplifies one of the most important stories of our time, which is that the born and the made are fusing. And as a result, also our notions of nature and culture have become very complicated, because of nature we thought of as everything born. Um, plants, animals, climate, the universe. And culture is everything made by people. Cars, houses, clothes, mobile phone, tool. But now they are fusing. And some people have proposed to simply put nature and culture on one pile and not think about these notions anymore. Yet that would also be a denial to the fact that for centuries people have used these terms to describe their living environment with all kinds of practical and ethical implications. So as an alternative, I propose that our notions of nature and culture are shifting. Allow me to elaborate this with a simple graph. Uh, if we put on one axis born and made, and on the other one uh, controlled versus autonomous, then we have now created four quadrants and we can put all kinds of things in there. So in the born controlled area, we see a rainbow tulip, a bonsai tree, a genetically modified banana or a genetically modified chicken. This is all born nature that's completely controlled by people. However, there's also still a lot of born nature left, which we don't control. Think of viruses, volcanoes, lightning or the sun. We don't have any control over the sun at all. It's just so much bigger than us. Then on the made side, we can put a car, a telephone, a robo dog, or a light bulb. However, in this upper area, things become more interesting because there we see phenomena like traffic jams, digital networks, computer viruses, or the financial system. These are man made entities that seem to grow beyond our control and develop a certain autonomy of their own. So while we used to think of nature as everything born, this is now shifting to a new notion of nature as everything that grows autonomously beyond our control. And here we see a next nature emerging, a nature caused by people. And this is an important new perspective, because traditionally we think of nature and technology as opposites, like black and white. But now we start to learn that our technology can also be naturalized. And that may sound a little bit abstract, so allow me to give an example from our own life. I think everyone here in the audience is still old enough to have lived in a world without a mobile phone. But then one day the mobile phone was introduced, people around you started buying one, and at a certain moment you thought, maybe I should also get a mobile phone. And today, when you leave your house without your phone, it feels as if you are missing a limb. 
And no, the phone is not part of your body. That's not the point. However, it has become an intimate part of your lifestyle and identity. And this all happened in less than 20 years. But it's not new. It's not a new development at all. Imagine I would have given this lecture a hundred years ago. I might have talked about electric light. Little over a hundred years ago, electric light was a radical new technology that had to be explained to people in the hotel rooms where it was first introduced. There were these little plates. This room is equipped with Edison electric light. Do not attempt to light with a match. Simply turn the key on the wall by the door. <laughs> and especially the disclaimer is very interesting, I think. The use of electricity for lighting is in no way harmful to health, nor does it affect the soundness of sleep. That's not something we worry about. For us, electric light is completely normal and we don't think of it as media or technology. Although it started out as this alien new technology, it soon became, well, perhaps a second nature. It might even become a first nature. Of course, this hasn't happened yet with electric light or mobile phones. But imagine I would have given this talk 10,000 years ago. I would have talked about agriculture. 10,000 years ago, agriculture was a radical new technology. Today, when we see these two ladies planting crops, we say, okay, this is, this is good. This is organic farming. <laughs> but it hasn't been always like that. Um, before agriculture, we used to live the hunting and gathering life on the savanna. But with agriculture, we settled down, started planting crops, wait for them to grow, and then harvest them which at the time was a profound intervention in the natural environment. And today we can hardly begin to even imagine a world without agriculture. One more example. Imagine I would have given this talk 200,000 years ago. I probably would have talked about cooking. When you look at an image of a barbecue today, you say it's going back to nature. However, once in the human history, cooking was a revolutionary new idea. For the first time, we started extending our stomachs in the outer world and pre-digesting our food before the eating. Without cooking, an average person today would have to eat about five kilos of raw food. Cooking allowed us to intake more calories in less time, which brought room to socialize more and to grow bigger brains. So if we look at this whole history of different technologies, from the stone axe to the domestication of fire, uh, to agriculture, to the invention of the wheel, the invention of writing, the invention of money, the industrial revolution, onto today's info, bio and nanotechnologies, if we see this whole development, we realize that people are by nature technological beings. And basically, we're doing the same thing all over again, which is we are playing with fire. <laughs> and now some say you, sh you should not play with fire. However, it also defines us as human beings that we do this. And no, we are not gods. We cannot even solve the problem of our own traffic jams. Rather, I think we are catalysts of evolution. But nature will never let us relax. Rather, it just changes along with us. So this is an entirely new perspective. We have to move away from the idea of nature as a static entity from the past that's now threatened and that has to be saved. Because there's another nature here, a dynamic nature. And once we have this new perspective, the world looks a little bit different. Allow me to share some examples from my own life. These are all the razor blades I used throughout my life. So when I was 17, I started with that little stick. And this morning, I shaved myself with this battery-powered, six-bladed device that looks a bit like a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> and I wonder, if I see the whole development, is this evolution? And some say, no, it's, it's not evolution, because we made this. Okay, but then maybe it's a co-evolutionary process. 
like the bees and the flowers, we are now co-evolving with our technologies. I read in the newspaper that biodiversity is decreasing. But then when I walk into the supermarket, I see an enormous amount of biodiversity. Right now there are more patents filed on the planet than known species. Should we call this biodiversity or perhaps technodiversity is a better term. And if this is the case, how do we balance biodiversity and technodiversity? Today, over 80% of all stock trading is done by computers. Is it time that we start to look at the financial system as an ecology in its own right? And if we do that, how can we garden its complexity? Perhaps financial en engineers can still learn a lot from farmers and gardeners who have profound experience of dealing with semi-autonomous complex uh, ecosystems like climate and weather. How will we build? Will we continue to build static structures after blueprints? Or will our architecture become more dynamic and integrated in the environment? These are the root bridges in India. So they have been simply made by connecting roots on two sides of the river. Could guided growth be a new design principle? And how do we guide the growth of, of this phenomenon? No, this is not some star nebula far, far away. Much closer than you think. This is a map of the internet. And every computer is plotted out as a little dot and all the connections between the computers as lines. And then you get this beautiful structure, which also seems to be the, a natural phenomenon. However, like the fish who don't know is wet, we are unaware that from the very first day that we are humans, we are co-evolving with our technology. So it is time for a mind shift. For once and for all, we need to accept that we created this technosphere. We need to embrace its complexity. It's growing bigger than us. We need to find ways to guide its growth rather than linger in the illusion of total control. And perhaps our experience with the biosphere might help us to cope with this emerging technosphere. We need to develop an ecological intelligence to balance these two spheres. And if we can do that, as mankind, we might leave something for the future that we can be truly proud of. Because in the end, it's just one sphere which happens to be our planet. Thank you. Thank you.